What is up everyone? Mark here at Lone University. Welcome to lesson 115. I'm very excited about this lesson. I've had a lot of requests for it and I've finally gotten everything together to really put it together in a concise manner uh, with lots of demonstrations and everything. So in this lesson, we're going to be talking about five tips for better tone. Now over the years, I've done several studio albums with uh, my band's Tetrafusion, Scale the Summit. I've done some guest work. I've played live hundreds of times and one of the biggest compliments I get is my tone. And anytime I see my name mentioned on the internet or something, it's always about Mark Michelle has great tone. And that's really awesome to see, but I'm gonna tell you here that I take very little, if any, credit for that. And I credit, you know, the amazing engineers uh, that we've worked with doing the albums and you know the good gear I've chosen to play. And uh, the credit I do take is these five things I'm about to share with you. And when I go in to play live and when I go in to do an album, I do these five things to make sure I'm getting the best source tone and I'm giving my best for the engineer to work with so they can have uh, the best end results. You know, the best initial source tones will always yield even better end results. So these are five measures I'm putting in place to make sure that I have my end covered so that when somebody works with my tone, they don't have to do a lot of extra work to make it sound good. Uh, it's gonna sound its best right out of the box. So here we go. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to record a bass line over a track out of our library. It's backing track number two. And uh, going out on a limb here, I purposely screwed up EQ. I, I changed my pickup heights, which really sucks because I, I found a sweet spot for these pickup heights. And I've screwed it up just for you guys, so hopefully I get it back to where it was. But I've gone through and purposely just done everything wrong that you should do with tone. I'm going to record an example bass line. You can hear it. And then we're going to go through these five steps, make the five adjustments. I'm going to re-record the same bass line. And you'll hear just how different these five things sound when done and uh, just how, you know, the type of wonders they work for your tone. So let's go ahead and record that. And you can hear what it sounds like with my opinion of bad tone. And then we'll go down the checklist. Let's check it out. Okay, so as you heard in that bass recording example, uh, the bass just didn't really cut through. And if I play some of this stuff solo, you'll hear a couple problems I want to point out. Number one, I'm playing with dead strings. We'll get to that. But number two, it just the, the tone just isn't good. And you can kind of hear when I do some higher stuff, uh, it just sounds uneven on the strings. If I just did two notes per string going up from the lowest string to the highest string, you'll hear how it just, the volume changes. It's really low when I come down, so you'll hear that that just is not good tone. The EQ sucks, it just it, it just doesn't sound very clear. There's not a lot of nuances, and I'm having to play really hard for the bass tone to be consistent, okay? So, step number one is the obvious. Play with new strings. And if you're one of those purists that wanna play with old strings, only play with old strings. And the problem is if you're, if you're inconsistent with your string changing habits, you're not gonna have consistent tone. You may play live one day with this tone, and then a month later, you may, you may play live again and have a, a dead string tone. And then you may change your strings every gig the next month. And then you may go a year without changing them. And when it comes to everything involved in the signal chain, you know, your amp settings that a lot of people just keep the same, they don't ever touch their amp settings or their pedal settings, you're just gonna have an inconsistent tone. If you're working with the same front of house personnel, the same studio engineer, or let's say you're recording an album that has eight tracks and you're just doing a different track, you know, every two weeks when you have time, it's not going to be consistent if you're not changing your strings every single song. But if you want to play the entire eight tracks with dead strings because you like that tone, you need to be consistent. All eight tracks on an album need to be consistent. And, you know, the life of the strings plays a huge role in how that sounds. And I know buying new strings for every gig is unrealistic and it's not in everyone's budget. And it, even if it is, it's not really realistic anyway, but a lot of people do it. 
So my thing about step one, when you're changing the strings, pick a side, either play with old strings a long time and really work with that tone or change strings very regularly or boil them or always wash your hands or clean them just to keep them as new as possible so that you have consistent tone. So step one, change strings. These strings are actually about a month and a half old, maybe longer. I can't remember the last time I changed them. So I'm going to go change my strings real quick and then we'll report back and go down the rest of the checklist. So see you soon. All right, so I'm back with freshly changed strings using the Jim Dunlop Super Bright Strings Medium Nickel Set, so 30 to 130 gauge for six string, just a little product plug there. I love these strings, I've been using them a long time now. So you can obviously tell my strings sound a lot more alive and just everyone knows that new strings sound. And yes, I really changed my strings. I didn't just turn on some like magic string reviver plug-in on the doll. I just changed the strings and you can see what this mess looks like. Uh, I'm sure you all know the look. So new strings, that's a big thing. And another thing I want to really make new strings a, a, a step in this five step thing is because new strings are the only way to have exact same results every single time. Even if you said, okay, I'm only going to record a new track when my strings are six, uh, six weeks old to the day. But during that whole six weeks, you may have eaten fried chicken and played bass. You may have not washed your hands. You may have not played the bass as much as the previous six weeks. So even if you say, I'm only going to record a track when my strings are six weeks old, that's still not going to be exactly the same. And of course, stick with the same brand, the same tension. Everything like that stays the exact same. So I can't stress that enough. Now let's move on to number two. Pickup height is so important. And that's a huge component as to what makes you have consistent tone. And when a lot of people think of good bass tones, when I think of good bass tones, when I hear a song and I say, man, that bass tone is just really good. The reason is, is because the tone is consistent. Everything they play is even, it has relatively the same volume, it has a similar tone throughout, and when they go up on a high little run or a bass fill all the way down to the lowest notes, it sounds even, the same. And pickup height has so much to do with that. And I see players all the time, uh, over the years I've taught or what have you, you know, I've seen them pick up their bass, plug it in, and when they do a scale or a little run from the lowest string to the highest string, you can hear the volume just go, uh, and they get to those higher strings. Just listen. You can hear it. Just the volume goes away. I'm playing the exact same strength on my plucking hand. I'm not changing how hard I'm plucking. And a lot of people complain, well, my high strings don't really cut through. And it's because look at your pickup height. If your pickup, pickups are angled, I don't know if you can really see here. Maybe, maybe I'll take a picture, but you can't quite see, uh, maybe if on the camera, but I have angled my pickups purposely. As I said at the beginning of this video, I've angled the high end down way too much and I've angled the lower string side way up. So what happens is you get these real boomy lows. There's a lot of low end. And when you creep up to these high strings, they just don't cut through. You may can hear them now because I'm playing by myself, but if I were to put this in a mix, like earlier, anytime you do a little fill or something on the high strings, it just disappears from the mix. That is the worst thing you can do when recording, even playing live, okay? So you wanna adjust your pickup heights. Now, not to take up an incredible amount of time in this video, there's an entire lesson on adjusting pickup heights here in the library. It goes through everything you need to know and I highly suggest you watch that after this if you have not seen it yet. So I'm gonna adjust my pickups back to where I had them, hopefully, and you'll hear how the tone is just more even. And really what I'm going for is not measurements. And a lot of people will take out a ruler and go, okay, two millimeters for this string, blah, 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 blah. Every string vibrates differently. If you have mixed string gauges, just there's so many factors. Just use your ears, pluck string to string, and just listen for a consistent volume all the way up. That's what you want, okay? Don't have too many lows on the low end, don't have your highs piercing and your low end kind of muffled. You want them just to all sound even. I keep my pickups pretty close to the string. I have actives. If you play passive pickups, you may not want to do them quite close because the magnet supposedly can interfere with the actual vibration of the string. I'm not going to make a complete claim on that, but that's what I've, I've seen players say. But if you use some soap bars or something, I get them really close to the strings and I keep them pretty even. Okay, so I'm going to adjust my pickups and I'll report back and uh, we'll hear the difference. Let's, let's leave you with a, a bad adjusted pickup height first, then we'll compare.
Okay, so I've now adjusted my pickups. You can see, maybe you can't, we don't know yet because I'm not looking at the camera, but they're much more even. You can kind of see that they're just uh, a lot closer to the pickups on both pickups. And again, I'm using my ears. I can pluck through each string now and hear the volume stay really similar. So I'm gonna play what I played before I adjust them. We'll put them back to back and you can kind of see how just adjusting the pickups makes a huge difference in string to string volume. You can hear once I go up, string volume is very, very relatively the same. So now when I go up to do a little bass fill, it's all right there in the mix and it doesn't drop out, okay? So adjust your pickup heights. Every bass is gonna be different. I'm not gonna recommend any sort of measurement or this and that. Just use your ears and make all strings sound equal in volume. And if you have actives, you can afford to get them a little closer to the pickups, okay? Another reason you want the string heights or the pickup heights really the same is because you want your blend knob to actually be accurate. If you have a blend knob on your bass, many basses do, but you know, you go all the way one way, you get the neck pickup, you go all the way the other way, you get the bridge, that's the neck. You go all the way the other way, had them backwards. You want those to be equal in volume too. That way when you're in the center detent, you have actual equal 50-50 uh, pickup of both pickups. And that's another really good thing about having good tone. I really recommend using the center detent to get the best of both worlds for both pickups. I always find that if I solo the bridge or solo the neck for you know my uh, main tone overall, I'm really missing something on either of them. And I just find it's much more full in the center detent. Maybe if I'm doing a solo or I want a certain effect or something, you can roll one way or the other. But a lot of people go all the way one way, all the way the other way, all the way neck or all the way bridge. And it just it misses a little bit of something. So I like having the best of both worlds, 50-50 on both pickups. So I keep my blend knob in the center detent, okay? Let's move on to step three. Now I'm gonna introduce you here to the trusty Warwick LWA-1000 amp, my main amp that I've been using for over two years now. Used it for numerous tours. Amazing amp, weighs five pounds. You can fit it in your backpack. It's just great. Very simple, easy to use, and it has a thousand watts of headroom, which is super important in uh, playing rock and metal shows. So lots of wattage, more than I'll ever need. It powers eight speakers perfectly with ease, and uh, that's that, so enough about that. So what you have here, I'm using this bottom channel here. You can kind of see how my EQ is. I have my bass turned up. I have my low mids, or my high mids, and my low mids. Actually, that's treble, sorry. I'm looking at it from the side. I have my uh, high mids and the low mids really scooped out. I pulled them out of the mix. A lot of bass players do this. And then I have my bass really cranked up over here. So this is called the scooped EQ. You have scooped. You have both sides of the EQ spectrum really high and then the mid range really low. A lot of people make the mistake of using a scooped EQ because it sounds the best by itself. You know, stand alone, a scooped EQ bass tone sounds really good. It's full, it's meaty, has the right amount of top end, and it's not just honky, not nasally. <laughs> Well, that, that sounds really good, but when you put this in a mix, there's lots of other things that, you know, taking up the high end and the low, and you're competing now with the low end of the guitars, the kick drum, the high end, the crash cymbals, the hi-hats, the chimey end of the guitars, the vocals, the, the synths, whatever it may be. So no one's really taking up that mid-range, and that's really where the bass needs to reside, sort of in that low mid to medium mid-range frequency. And if you crank those EQs up by itself, the bass sounds real thin and honky. A lot of people hate that tone. But the best tones for bass sound best in the mix. The best bass tones sound not that good by themselves. That is the absolute truth. I've AB'd the crap out of this. I've tested this. Multiple basses, albums, I've been told this. 
not words that I came up with, words of wisdom from other bass players. The best bass tones sound not very good by themselves, but they sound amazing in the mix. Take my word for it. So the scooped EQ is never what you want to really go into unless you just like that sort of sound in your mix. But if you really want to cut through and have definition, and in my opinion, good tone, use the mid-range. Use the mid-range. Use the mid-range. Use the mid-range. It is there to help you in a mix with lots of other things going on. Take my word for it. So what we're going to do, I'm going to teach you something I use called the ground up EQ. And what this is called, it's sort of a way just to reset your tone and really let your ears refresh themselves um, on your tone. If you've had the same amp settings and play in the same venue, let's say you're in a, a club band, house band, and you just have the same amp, same settings, you get really used to that sort of tone and you may not realize that you actually have too much bass more than you need and it's really muddying up the mix. Or you have too much high end and everyone in the audience can hear it just clanking through, whatever. You need to every now and then use this ground up EQ reset method. And it's sort of like standing out in the sunlight and then coming inside. It's like, whoa, is it really that bright outside? You have to let your eyes readjust to the light just like you have to let your ears readjust to the sound. So what I do is I'll sometimes go into a new venue on tour or whatever, if I'm redoing new tone with new strings, I'll turn all my EQ down like this. So I will literally take this, make sure I'm on the right knobs here. Yep, okay. I feel like a, a weatherman, can't really see the screen, you have to look over. Okay, so everything is down. So when I play with that tone, you're getting to get this sound. It's just very low, very low gain, you don't really hear anything, okay? So what I do is I start by leaving the bass and treble all the way down and I turn the low mid and the high mid, or maybe it's just one mid knob, I turn that straight to flat. The mid range is where you really hear the character of the tone. That's the most honest representation of your bass sound, your string sound, your pickup sound. The mid range uh, resonates best with the human ear because that's sort of where a voice uh, resides and that's what we're used to hearing. So what I do is I go through and I turn up my mid range to flat. Now forgive me if I'm not exactly flat, I'm looking from the side here. So let's start with that. Now you're going to hear this tone that may not sound great. It sounds very thin, of course, we have treble and bass down. But this is the most honest sound, more, more represent, uh, representative of the acoustic sound of your bass. It's kind of like holding a microphone up to your bass if you were just playing it unplugged. Now, what you do with this tone is I like to sort of adjust the tone here. Maybe I want a little more beefiness without the bass. So you just go to the low mids for that. So I kind of crank my low mids a little bit. Let's start there. You can hear it fill out a little bit. Now let's play around with the high mids and see if we can afford to give them a little more without it getting too clanky. Didn't have too much clank, it just gave it a little more immediacy, I guess. Now, if you play it around on this tone for 10 minutes, you'd actually start to kind of trick yourself into thinking it was full enough and it had enough treble. And that's what, where it goes to show you that you don't need as much bass and treble as you think. Your ears were just used to hearing it, so you kind of start to tune it out. So now, if you just listen to this tone for a while, if I add in even a little bit of bass, think about it, just listen how much fuller this sounds now. So that's already adding a lot of bass, okay? So what I do is when I do this ground up EQ, I sort of get the tone I want, a tone that sounds as good as it's possibly gonna get with just those mid-range knobs, and then I adjust bass and treble to taste. I turn up the bass just enough to where it starts to sound full, and I turn up the treble just enough to where I get that sparkly top end and it's not piercing, just enough to give it a little more presence. And that will sort of cause you naturally to have a subtractive EQ, where instead of always boosting everything to get more, you start taking things away to let the other thing comp to let the other things compensate. That is very important when EQing things. You don't want to just boost everything. I need more bass, boost more bass. Okay, now the treble's too low, you boost the treble. Okay, now the mid-range is gone, but, and everything is just maxed out. It's a very unhealthy gain signal to have. So start with this ground up EQ and adjust to taste. Get the mid-range where you want it, bass and treble, just turn them up slowly until you can hear it just fill out on the low end, and then just enough on the high end to let it just kind of sparkle up a bit. So. It felt pretty good right there. 
That's a lot of low end. It's really resonating in this room. So now the top end, you can hear the top end kind of sound muffled now. So I'm just going to add a little bit of treble. It's getting there. Let's add a little more. Probably about the same place as the bass would be. Now these are new strings, so I would naturally have the treble down anyway. Maybe a little more bass. I think I'm actually going to use the low mids for that. Let's try that. Travel maybe a little less. That sounds really good to me. That is my ideal bass tone, and I've naturally arrived at the same settings I had before I started the Scoop DQ. Those are very close to the settings I've been using for the last two years. I've got really liberal high and low mids, a little more in the low mids. Bass just to taste and treble. Would, you know, if my strings were a little older, I would have them a little higher. So as my strings age, I kind of ride up that treble knob, but that's with new strings. This is the perfect tone for me personally. And every string still sounds even because I have the right pickup heights. Listen. My high C string and my low B string are the exact same volume. I can even look on the gain structure over there. They're very close. So pick up heights and EQ, ground up EQ, try this method with your amp. And what I want you to do is when you do this, play on that setting where you just have the mid knobs up. Play on that for like an hour, maybe a day. Actually go a whole day. If you got nothing going on, you're not gigging or anything, just do it for a day and your ears will completely readjust to hearing mids more prominently. And then when you start to add that bass and treble in, you'll hear, wow, I had a lot more than I remember. And if you actually turn your bass and treble knobs up to where they were before, you're going to be like, wow, that's a lot of bass. Maybe I don't need that much. It's adding some muddiness into my lines. Or maybe, wow, it was just way too clanky. It's actually kind of piercing. So this is a great way to reset your ears and just get a very honest uh, re reset of your tone, okay? Step number four, play with the signal on the hotter end as much as possible. Now this is kind of goes into the gain structure territory. I'm not going to get too much into that. But just to debunk uh, the misconception about gain and master volume that for a long time I didn't have any idea what the heck that meant. Gain, input gain is this knob over here. Okay, it's turned down about nine o'clock. Input gain and master volume are two different things. So if you have no idea what this means, this is very important. Listen up. Gain and input gain is how much volume is being let into the amp from the bass. So if you had the input gain all the way up, it would essentially be like letting as much signal in as possible from the bass. So if you want to look at it like this, okay, the amp's right here. I don't think you can see it in this main camera, but it's like how much volume am I letting into the amp? And then from the amp, how much volume is it letting in to the computer or the cabs or whatever you're going through? So input gain is very important. A lot of people keep that low and then they just turn the master volume up like this. Now my master volume doesn't work right now because I'm not hooked up to any cab, so this, this, this does nothing right now. The actual master volume in this equation is on my interface. So in a minute I'm going to go turn that up and just imagine the, no the volume knob on my interface as this. Okay? I don't have any cab, so this is why this doesn't work. But normally I see a lot of people turn their input gain down and then I see this knob cranked. I'm like, why? So you're basically telling the amp to be super loud, but with very little signal. So you're turning up something very loud that was really quiet to begin with. And that's what I did in this first playing example. And when you have low input gain, it causes you to have to like really play really hard to get it to sound even. And you know, couple that with low pickup, low pickup height and you know, old strings, anything past the A string is just gonna get lost. And Playing with hotter signal, it allows you to have a very consistent tone. So what you want to do is make the signal more hot. Now, this is a very dead signal. I'm having to pluck relatively hard to get it, uh, harder than I normally do, to get it equal volume. But let's say I just crank this input gain. Now if I plucked really quiet, you'd hear how much headroom I now have. It's very hot, everything's very sensitive. So if you play with a hotter signal, and play with a lighter touch, you're going to have more stamina, endurance, but when you play lighter, you have much more control over the consistency of each note. If my input gain is real low, 
and I'm having to play like, that's way too low. Let's go here so I get something. If my input gain is there, I'm having to play every note at 10 out of 10 just to get it to cut through. So that's like getting it to normal. If I want to go louder than that, I have nowhere to go. There's no dynamics with it. Now, if I try to play quiet, there's just, there's just no dynamic range there. Now, if I crank my input gain up, I usually have mine about right here. Now, I have my master volume up really high too, so I'll have to compensate for that in a minute. But you'll notice that I can play very light. If I want to get loud, it's going to clip it out because I got to, I got to obviously compensate. But playing with a hotter gain structure means I can play lighter and have a very consistent tone. I've talked about this in some other videos about having control with technique. If someone said, here's a baseball, throw it as hard as you possibly can and get it through this slot 50 feet away. If you threw the ball as hard as you absolutely can, it's going to be a lot harder to get it through the slot and be accurate and precise with control than if you, you know, did whatever you could to just be light and just really aim and just kind of throw it a little softer. You have more control when doing things not as hard. That's the idea with this. I talked about that in the double thumb video. It just came to me. So play with a lighter touch and a hotter signal, and then when you want to get loud, you have all that extra room to just really dig in if you want to, but your bass tone is very light and consistent, and that just makes for better technique and better tone. So now I'm going to go over here and adjust uh, the volume knob over there to compensate for the gain I just raised. So let me go do that. Okay, so I've changed the master volume. You saw me turn it down significantly because I'm compensating for the input gain I've added. So what now what's happening is I'm getting a very hot signal from the input, my bass, into the amp, and I'm giving a little less to the master, you know, the master line. So it allows me to play with a hotter signal, lighter touch, more consistent tone. It all goes back to being consistent with the tone. Okay? So I might even go a little more. Let's try that. I usually keep mine pretty high. And I've done this forever and it always works. I just like having a very hot signal. You can just really feel, it's like you can just really feel it a lot more and you're not struggling to play super hard just to get a basic note to cut through. It feels very responsive. So very important, I suggest you try this. And uh, if you didn't know what input gain and master volume meant, that's what it means. So if I was just on the amp, let me uh, backtrack. If I turn my input gain up, if I'm playing with cabs, I would have turned this down to compensate, okay? So this is basically the master volume knob if I were using cabs. If I'm using an interface into a DAW, I would use the interface uh, master volume there. Last step, choose your frets carefully. Now this is a, a really interesting angle and a more advanced concept, concept, but something I really, now that I've been playing a long time, I really start to focus on this when it comes to what frets should I play? What kind of sound do I want? And you'll know that when you, you play different frets on your bass, they make different sounds. And we've talked about in lesson 40, learning the notes on the fretboard, if you have a 24 fret bass with four strings, you have eight instances of every note on the neck. And it, or if we're talking the same octave, maybe three or four. You'll notice that if I play a bunch of different A's, they're gonna sound different. This A is the same octave as this A, but it just sounds totally different. Let's listen to the difference in tone. Same note, different range of the neck, very different tone. Okay, that plays a big part on how it sounds live, on album, whatever. So choose your frets carefully. Now, I personally recommend don't ever use open strings when playing. If you're sustaining whole notes or you're kind of doing a slower, more static moving bass part, never use open strings. Open strings have a totally different tone than when they're fretted. <laughs> They're, they're tinny, they're more metallic sounding, they're thinner, and you know, you have, okay, I'm playing a six string bass, I have six open strings versus a billion fretted notes. The tone of a fretted note is inherently different than the tone of an open string. So if you're playing 99 fretted notes and you use an open string for that hundredth uh, note, it, it's gonna sound different than the other 99. You want consistency. The theme here is be consistent. So when I played the example at the beginning of this video, I used a lot of open strings. <laughs> And you, 
can just hear the tone difference. If you have a really good ear, you can hear just when I go to those open strings, it kind of goes bum bum ki don don, and it just has a tinny tone. It's just different and it's inconsistent. And when you put that on record through a stereo, that'll be where the bass drops out. Again, consistent tone. I'm gonna say it a thousand times. So I would I would take this whole bass line I played and put it over here. And one thing I like to do, if the bass line isn't really technical or fast, I'm not just going more, you know, in a scale format where I'm changing strings a lot, I like to play everything on one string. So play more linear, play more scalular. And that's a reason why people go for that grand piano bass tone. Everybody says, I want my bass tone to have that grand piano-like sound. And that's because it's on a linear scale. You go up one string, the tone's gonna be consistent. Okay, if I play an entire song on one string, that's gonna be a really consistent tone. There's no other factors. So instead of going, where I'm using A string, E string, and open string, I can just go. That's very, you know, way more consistent and very much more even than this. When I go to that A string, go to that G fretted, it just, it just fills up more. The EQ really does change versus so choose your frets carefully. I would want to play a part that would maybe be like, you know, something chordal. Too bassy up here, too muddy. I'd want to play that down here. So if I'm playing a more chordal part, think closer to the nut. It's thinner, it allows the notes to ring out more. And this is something that really only applies to bass. When guitar players play, they're playing multiple notes a lot of the time. So if you have an open string and then a fretted note and then another open string, it's all gonna blend together as one sound anyway. The problem is you're gonna hear the inconsistency much more on bass because we're 99% of the time playing one note. Play things more on one string. But if you're changing strings, something's more technical. The, the sweet spot for me is playing everything between frets 5 and 12. That's sort of the middle range of these strings. I find the strings resonate the best there. Play that same thing over here. Just doesn't sound as full. I find everything sounds the best between frets 5 and 12. If you venture up here, you'll notice the notes get super bassy. You just get a little more buzz. You go down here, they're not bassy enough. They're just kind of honky. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna record the same bass line. We're gonna A, B them, and you'll hear just how different these five steps make to achieving better tone. Thanks for watching. I hope you put these into your playing, your bass, your amp, your EQ settings, your technique. You'll notice these will go a long way in a live setting or a studio setting, and good luck to you. Thanks for watching. Let's take a listen.